Good afternoon. Today we will learn another defense mechanism, address space layout randomization, uh, shortened as an ASLR, uh, which simply randomized the stack, heap, code, global variable addresses. So basically the entire address space of the, uh, the program uh, could be randomized in order to make the attackers hard to find where to return, for example, hard to find shellcode or hard to find the address of the system function. Uh, and we will also learn about the how to avoid such a defense. So from the previous lecture, we have learned the base and bound check as a fundamental defense to buffer overflow vulnerability, but it is slow, around two to three times slower than the regular execution, so we don't use it. And uh, uh, alternative, as an alternative way, uh, so we learned about the several exploit mitigation techniques, and the first one was a stack cookie, and this one is a simple and efficient defense by putting a stack cookie values right before the uh, save the BP and the return address, and if the, that is overwritten, then that could be a little canary uh, in the cave that detects uh, carbon monoxide before human dies, so it will detect the attack before the return address gets smashed by the attack. But this can only defeat the sequential buffer overflow variability, and now we know how to avoid the such defenses by exploiting the cloning nature of fork system call in the stack cookie 3. So all the child processes will share the same cookie value, so we can guess byte by byte, and also bypassing uh, cookie overwriting by changing the index variable in stack cookie 4 example. So we are we have learned that how to defeat the GCC's uh, standard defense for stack cookie. And then we also learned uh, data execution prevention as a defense to shellcode in the injection. And but in for this defense, uh, we can reuse existing code in the library, such as system, if we know the address, or uh, we can even call, chain multiple function calls, such as open, read, and write. Uh, to read out the flag with the privilege, uh, privilege of the program uh, by reusing existing code. So these two defense does not cover uh, the like the uh, the target of the like the uh, return address. For example, like the what attacker wants to run. And today we will learn another type of the exploit mitigation that directly, uh, directly uh, deals with the like the lead attackers don't know about like the where it should return to. So for example, don't know about the where shellcode is, and also don't know about where the library function is located. So it randomized the addresses to hide that from the attacker. And let's check, and before getting into the detail, let's check how we exploit the buffer overflow vulnerability uh, for right now. So if there is a buffer overflow vulnerability, then we will fill the buffer and then overwrite the return address as the address of the shellcode, like this. And to make this happen, we need to know where our shellcode is. So it starts with the 683258. So from the like the GDB dump, we can find the 683258 here. So we can know that the shellcode address is FFFFDF31. Yeah. This is how we find the shellcode and then how we override the return address to the shellcode to run it. So in previous challenges, uh, uh, these are like the not enabled with the, uh, these are on the server, BMCTF1, which is disabled. Uh, which has the disabled option for the ASRL, so we can find our shellcode address in a fixed location. But what ASRL, the address space layout randomization, uh, do is that uh, because attackers must know the exact address, so attackers need to know the which address to jump or execute, yeah, to run the shellcode or other functions in the library code. So maybe stack, we can randomize the stack for shellcode, a library for the, like the not knowing about the system, where the system function is, and also the randomized heap, and then we will learn about this later. So as a defense, a system designer took an approach to randomize 
these addresses. If attacker don't know where the code is, then they cannot run it. So that's uh, it's very simple logic, and then system designer try to randomize uh, up to uh, up, uh, uh, adopted to randomize such the addresses at each time of the program's execution. So if we do so, if the random is secure, then the attackers will never know where the shellcode is, where the system function is located, so they do not know where to jump. Then we can make attackers being unable to attack even if they know how to exploit the vulnerability, but their attack should stop at the cannot knowing about where to return. So this is very simple logic and it's very easy to implement. So after introduced by like the Linux packs in 2002, OpenBSD adopted this technique in 2003, and Linux adopted it in 2005, and the Windows, uh, they uh, adopted it starting from Windows Vista, and both iOS and Android uh, applied it in 2011. And even if the this kind of the logic, the logic about the randomizing heap stack library and code and data area, yeah, is very simple. Uh, the reason why it is adopted late, like a, a span over, like in the nine years or something, is that uh, mainly because of the compatibility issue. So the still some of the program uh, programmers uh, has, have some of the bad habits for uh, using some of the fixed address values for the some variables or accessing some part of the program. So in that case, uh, randomizing the address will uh, will never work with the, those kind of the tricks. So nowadays the compilers are generating like the uh, ASRL friendly code so we can randomize the code, uh, program code and data uh, anywhere in the memory space but uh, for the legacy programs uh, it does not work and that's why uh, it takes uh, several years to <coughs> excuse me, to adopt the, this defense to the operating system. And uh, for the kernel space, so uh, we just to cover the, like, the user's program space, and then for the kernel space, the history of the ASRL starting from like the user space in 2005, Windows kernel in 2007 first, and then uh, OS X and iOS kernel in 2012, and then Linux kernel in 2014. So it's interesting that like Linux adopted it in a way before that then the Windows and iOS are adopting the ASRL, but in reality, Windows kernel was the first one to apply the ASRL in the kernel, and then OS X, uh, Mac OS was the second, and then the Linux kernel was the last, uh, is the last for the uh, three major operating system. Yeah. And then just for fun, uh, I inserted this figure, and then this is a photo of uh, Keys Cook, uh, this guy, who maintains the Linux kernel security. So he actually maintains the entire Linux kernel security and then uh, review all the code for the security related thing, and also apply the, some of the security mechanisms to the upstream Linux kernel. And the interesting thing is that uh, this guy lives in the Portland the metro area, so he sometimes came down to Kovalis uh, to give a talk about Linux kernel exploitation and Linux kernel security. And this is the photo of him at the Kelly Engineering Center in 2019, I believe. Yeah, I captured it by my iPhone. Uh, I asked them like the whether I can I can take a photo or not. Yeah. <laughs> so and then this is like the class one zero zero three maybe. Yeah. So. Uh, Maybe sometimes later you guys can also meet the Keys Cook uh, when COVID the pandemic ends, I believe. And how ASRL works is as follows. When we run a program instance, its stack, library, heap, and program code uh, can be located like this. And then the next time we run the program, that each, each of the section will be randomized. For example, the program code was here, but that the next time it could be here or it could be there. And then same thing for the library code, it was here, and then at the next time of the execution, it could be rebased uh, like this, and then also change the base address to the like the another location like this. But in the figure, and stack and heap addresses are look like static, but it's not. This also moves around the 
uh, entire address space uh, across the multiple execution. And then the in the VMCTF3 server, yeah, you can see the program name, the ASRL check, and then the, I inserted that in the challenge directory, but this is not the actual challenge. But if you run that file, then it will run the same program for five times. Yeah. And then it will print out all the stack and heap and libc address. And then in the program, it will basically print out the same address, but because the system randomized it, it's a stack location. So across the multiple run, stack addresses are changing and then also heap addresses are changing 913 73b 716 601 right and also library addresses are like some part of them are the same but the uh, e26 dd7 e31 ddc tcc dbc yeah some some other part of it is are changing so the system is randomizing uh, those addresses And then important thing is that the, with the ASRL turned off, all these address values, all these address values are all same. But uh, with the ASRL turned on, because the system randomized the uh, stack, heap, libc, and then code and data area at each time, so that's why it is changing. Yeah. Then how can you bypass this? Uh, some of you might think that uh, do something like this. So maybe you can get one address, address of the one instance. So for example, you crash the program and use GDB uh, from the core file, get the address of the shellcode. And then use the same address for the next attack, set the, that shellcode address from GDB core uh, as the return address, and then run that for multiple times, many, many times. Then, even if the shellcode address could be random, uh, if the system may reuse the same address as a random by chance, then the attack could be successful. Would this be possible? To answer that, we need to know how much randomness we can have in such address spaces. So, and then this is the table for summarizing the uh, randomizing entropy and then chance of the winning if you use the same address again and again. And for this 32-bit machine, for the stack address, it has a 19 bits of entropy, so your winning chance is a 1 over a 2 to the 19. So uh, in a once in a half million running, yeah, you can match the stack address. So it randomizes these like the four digits yeah but uh, uh, last bit is not uh, changing so like it, it, that's why like the it uh, randomizes the uh, what is that uh, 19 bits and then the for the 32 bit heap addresses yeah so these heap addresses so it changes uh, only the three digits but uh, one more bits at the uh, top Byte. So the, it has a 13 bit of entropy, so your winning chance of winning is a 1 over uh, 2 to the 13, uh, 8,000, around 8,000. And then for the library space, uh, it has like the very little change, only these three digits, but uh, part of it. So uh, it has a winning chance of the 1 over 512, which is somewhat feasible. So if you want to try like this kind of the brute force attack, set a fixed address and then run it multiple times to uh, execute the system function or something, then please try uh, library space. So maybe attacking the library address would be feasible in 32-bit, but this only applies to 32-bit machines. The security factor is enlarged uh, much when we get to the 64-bit machine. In 64-bit machine, uh, for the stack, we have a 30 bits entropy. Heap and library, it has a 20 bits, 28 bits of the entropy, so your chance of winning would be the one over several hundreds of a million times. And in uh, if the system reuses the same address uh, for the successful attack. So in 64-bit machine, uh, we have a bigger 
address space. So the, we have a larger pointer than the, this four byte. So it has a six byte pointers for this 48 bit space. And then we can see many digits of the stack addresses are changing. So the stack has like a 30 bits of the entropy. And then that raises the bar for the, like the uh, brute force attack from the attacker. So it looks good once it is applied. So it sets a bar for the attack as like the one over several hundreds of million or several billion. Yeah, then uh, we would like to use it. Then what's the overhead of having ASRL? So fortunately, it requires uh, randomizing has been done at the randomizing must be done at the start of the program at once. So its runtime overhead is less than 1%, and why not zero? The reason is that the, we have a little bit of overhead for like the uh, pointing to the, some of the global variable or string literal. literal. For example, uh, when we supply the argument to printf as a, this kind of a string literal, it could be placed at here as a data section. Uh, previously, without ASRL, we can put the, some of the specific address. For example, print app at, and push uh, 8048322 uh, or something, uh, exact address of the ASDF. But with the ASRL, uh, what we can get is not the exact address, but what we can get is like the from the current code address, we can have the fixed relative offset to the uh, this string literal. And to pass the argument, uh, the address of the, the ASCDF as an argument to the printf, uh, what we need to do is like the, we need to add this offset to the RIP, which is the current instruction pointer. And then this is how we fetch the address of the ASDF. So we don't know where these two areas uh, as a concatenated one yeah, can be located in any kind of address. And then we don't know where it is. But uh, what we know is that the distance between the, this code and the data is fixed, and then programs are compiled like that. And then if, even if we don't know start address, if we know that current code address, then add the offset, and then take that address to the RDI as the first argument. Then we can call printf with the supplied with the uh, ASDF as an argument. And in 32B machine, so uh, no, uh, before moving to the next, yeah, this kind of the, the additional uh, relative addressing, yeah, incurs like the around the 1%, less than 1% over overhead in 64B machine. So it's quite negligible. So uh, ASRL, that's why ASRL is adopted widely because it has a very little performance overhead. And in 32B machine, we will have a little more overhead around the 3% uh, of the execution time overhead. And the reason is like that we cannot uh, use the relative addressing use the, uh, over EIP because EIP is hidden in 32-bit. So there's no instruction that we can perform uh, some of the operations on EIP register. Then uh, how can he access the current code address and then add the offset to uh, refer to the uh, string literal value and the way of doing that is so to get the current code address uh, what we will do is like uh, we will call to the next instruction so this call plus five is a call instruction it has like five bytes uh, of code so it will just call the next instruction so the difference is difference between the jump and the call is that the call will store the return address as the next instruction address. So by doing call plus five, then it will call to the next address. And then on the stack, uh, when we execute this instruction on the stack, it will store the address of the disk code as the return address. So we call some of the function, we need to return to the next uh, address of the uh, next, next instruction of the call, right? So we will store the address of the disk code into the stack, and then what we will do next is pop EBX. So we directly pop the return address, and then it will store the code of the code address of the this instruction, and then add the offset. Then we can supply the address of the this string literal to EBX. 
and it has a control flow transition and then three instructions rather than one instruction and that's why it has like around the three percent overhead uh, for the execution yeah then how can you bypass uh, this ASRL so we just learned about like, how good ASRL is then how can you bypass this yeah so one of the ways like launching the brute force attack yeah. To do this, we can get a core dump, and then from the GDB, uh, reading the core dump, uh, figure out the uh, some of the shellcode address or the address of the library function, and then set that address as the return address and run for many, many times. Yeah. And maybe if you launch the attack to the 32-bit libraries, then you want to run at least 512 times. But uh, more than that, because uh, it has a little bit of random, then eventually the address will be matched and uh, your library code or shell code could be running uh, with that address. But before doing this, please refer to the table on the right side, which tells your success rate. And please try this only the cases with the high success rate, maybe the 32 bit library, yeah, or maybe 32 bit stack, but uh, it would take like a too long time, yeah, if it requires uh, like around a half a million uh, execution. And then for the 64 bit stack and hit, uh, I would rather purchase a Powerball and wishing for the jack jackpot uh, than wishing for our exploit succeed. Shortly, I would like to use the same chance of luck for a more valuable step. Yeah. Maybe exploiting the challenge could be more valuable than a powerful jackpot for some of you. So that's the dumb way of uh, bypassing ASRL. And uh, some of the smart way of uh, doing that is uh, leaking the address as a hint to the randomized address space. And to practice that, so in the ASRL1 challenge, uh, the, I designed the program to directly tell where the buffer address is. So this is the buffer address. And then if you put the shellcode at the start of the buffer, then you can put this as the return address. Yeah, this is easy. Yeah, and then this is just uh, practicing that uh, uh, leaking some of the address will let you bypass ASRL completely. Yeah, so the defense definition of the ASRL is that the uh, let attackers, uh, the, so making attackers don't know about uh, the where to return. And then if we know one of the address, the target address, then the defense is nullified. So I placed this challenge to tell you that any kind of the address leak could be helpful for bypassing the ASRL, but in this case, it was too direct. Yeah. So in reality, leaking the exact target address could be difficult, but don't give up. Yeah. And uh, we can still exploit the even if we cannot uh, directly leak the address, uh, the leak the target address directly. But uh, even with the partial knowledge of the program's address space layout. For example, leaking some other addresses, uh, we might have a chance to break the ASRL completely. And to understand that, uh, we need to know how exactly the memory addresses are randomized by the system. And that is, it will only change the base address of each area. What that means is, so across multiple running for this program code, it will move the base address to here and then all the internal contents will remain the same same thing for the another uh, execution and then same thing for the library and heap and stack area so what that means is that it will just change the start address and all the relative addressing within the area uh, will be the same so for example uh, so suppose you have a stack start at the FFFF E000 as a, this address, and then you have some uh, your shellcode at FFFF D800 for one of the execution around here. Yeah. 
then from the GDB core, uh, you can get this address. And you can also get this stack start. Then you can get the relative offset from the stack start to the shellcode as uh, subtracting the stack start by the, the this address. Yeah. Then you will get the offset 0x800. Then next time, if you know the stack start address, if you subtract this offset, then that's the exactly same. Uh, uh, that the address will point to the same data uh, that it was having in the uh, this address in the first uh, the previous execution. So the important thing is that the relative addressing within this each of the area will not be changing. So same thing applies to the system function. So if you know that the base address of the library C library, and then if you know the system uh, function offset, then if you add that, then you can get the address of the system. But the problem is that uh, to apply this kind of the offset thing, so you can get the offset from the program uh, by reverse engineering program code and library code or like the uh, analyzing stack for the one execution. Uh, you can get the offset, but how can you apply this offset even in case if you don't know about the, this kind of the base addresses? And uh, uh, before moving to next, I will show the, another uh, example of the uh, how ASRL is applied. So uh, there is a program called the ASRL check two in the challenge directory in VMCTF three machine, and then. Across the multiple execution, we are seeing that the one, two, three executions. And if you take a look at the distance between these two variables, so variable two, variable one, if we subtract the, these two addresses, uh, we have eight, right? And then another eight for the, this one. Subtract this and this, eight, and then this and this, another eight. Uh, the, uh, not eight, four, right? So distance of the these two are eight, and then these two are four. So also for the these two, distance is eight. These two values, distance is four. So the relative distance are is the same. And then same thing applies to the heap object. From the heap object one, two, three, uh, we have a constant distance uh, zero x ten, zero x ten, which is sixteen. 0x10, 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 yeah. And then also for the library addresses. So in the ASRL check 2, I printed the address of the printf, puts, and system, and then the offset between the printf and puts, and printf and system. And then even if the addresses are changing across the multiple execution, the relative offset between the printf and puts and printf and system, these are all same. So in ASRL2 challenge, so it will not directly leak the uh, buffer address, but it will leak some of the addresses in the program space. Yeah. Then your task is to identify one of the address that has the fixed offset to your buffer address. So to calculate that, uh, you can get the core dump of the, this uh, program first to figure out the, your buffer address from the GDB. And then get the offset of the each of the leaked address. So you can get the offset of the each of the, these addresses. And then if you run it again, get the offset again, and then if the offset is the same, then that's the fixed relative addressing from the sum of the address here to your buffer address. And then in the third running, if you can detect maybe uh, maybe uh, this value, yeah, this value looks like a stack value. And then if you can get the like the distance from the this address to the, your buffer as a fixed offset, then the next time you run, if you see the, this address, and then get the address, and then add the offset, then you can get the buffer address. So 
calculate the offset from like a one or a two execution and then after observing that uh, apply that offset to exploit uh, to get the buffer address and then the jumps to the shellcode in ASRL2. And uh, we just learned about the how we can get the buffer address from the stack offsetting then how can you get the offset of the system, printf, or other functions in the library? Uh, like thinking about like the case that we have uh, both the DEP and ASRL enabled at the same time. So in that case, we cannot use our shellcode. Uh, we need to, we must return to the libc function. And in that case, how can you get the address? To do that, uh, you can run LDD, uh, the binary that shows like what kind of the dynamic library the program loads uh, to the target program. Then the, you can see the list of the libraries, and then this is the location of the where the C library is. Then you can use GDB to open this C library. After that, uh, you can print system print print up print puts to get the offset of the each of the function. So, and then this offset is uh, starting from the ellipse base. So to attack the library, if you can leak uh, one of the library address, for example, if you can leak the address of the printf, yeah, then just, just get the offset from the uh, system and printf, and then apply that to the leaked address. Then you can get the address of the system because the, all the relative offset are the fixed. And for ASRL, to have a strong defense, uh, there must be no leak in addresses. And also, all the areas must be randomized, not just for stack and heap. And what this means is that, so at the start of the, the ASRL adoption, uh, stack, heap, library code, and data are randomized well in 2005. However, still some of the Linux distributions has not applied the full ASRL to the uh, program code and data area. And this is the example of the uh, readl of result of the bin cat from Ubuntu 1604. Yeah. And what it says, the ELF file type is an exec executable file which means that the code section of the, this program is not randomized at all. So we can see the entry point address is 8049E68, somewhat the fixed address. Yeah. On the other hand, this is the read the error of the result of the same distribution, but for the binary BNSH, then this binary type is a dynamic uh, shared object file. The reason is that the library file is uh, naturally the position independent, which means that uh, it could be located anywhere uh, and compatible to AS at all, but the uh, regular programs are not. So later, uh, Linux and then other programs uh, apply the ELF format for like the making the uh, executable file also be a shared object file file. So we can actually run that. And then it's entry point address. Yeah, it has a, like the, the offset of the entry point, not the specific address. Yeah. So in short, uh, full ASRL is applied to this binary, but not for this binary. Yeah. But in these days, uh, most major distributions such as Ubuntu, Fedora, or Arch applied full ASRL for their program code and the same for the Mac OS and Windows. And then this kind of the uh, applying the ASRL uh, making the attack more difficult without leaking the address space knowledge. So, and even with the 64-bit, uh, brute force will never have a chance to uh, bypass the ASRL without any kind of leak. So up to now, we learned how ASRL works and then how to defeat them conceptually. And now it's the time to practice the attack with the challenges. And for ASRL1, it leaks the buffer address directly, so you can put your shellcode in the buffer and jump to there. In ASRL2, it leaks some addresses in the stack. Yeah. Then you need to apply some of the relative offsetting to get the buffer address and then apply that offset to the next execution to run your shellcode. 
for ASR3, it is a variant of the ASRL2, so it's a very slightly difficult version of the ASRL2. And then it leaks some of the variables in the stack and read that as an address and then use a relative addressing too. Yeah. And then the ASRL4, yeah. And then it leaks the address of the printf function. Then you can figure out the address of the system function uh, by applying relative offset, at, uh, uh, relative addressing by applying the offset. And in ASRL four a uh, five, the program contains a function that you can leak some addresses. Call that to leak, then then it will be similar to ASRL two. Then you can use leak the address. Uh, and uh, launch your shellcode. And then the, the reason why I put the, this challenge is that the ASRL2 is too artificial. And the case of the ASRL5 is that the, you are reusing your program code that is not randomized for something like this case, but the, it does not have uh, any kind of the shellcode. But the, you can use that to leak some of the address, then you can finally run the shellcode. And for the last, ASRL 6, uh, this apply the full ASRL. So please launch the brute force attack for this and please choose a wise target for the attack with the low entropy and higher chance for success. And all the challenges are in VMCTF3 servers. So for the DEP and the stack cookie, they are in VMCTF1. And for the uh, ASRL challenges, uh, they are in VMCTF3 because the ASRL is applied to the operating system, so we change the machine for those challenges. Yeah, and please use the same uh, private key and ID uh, because like the all the servers have shared uh, your public key. Yeah, so you can uh, if you can connect to VMCTF1, then with the same setup with the private key, then you can connect to the VMCTF3 too. And all the challenges are week four uh, directory. So fetch week four, the command uh, will fetch all the things as a symlink. And the due date for the challenges for entire week four, including DEP and the stack cookie, uh, is on next Thursday.